watch this video. If you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe to my channel for new punk rock videos every week and tap the bell to get notified when new videos drop. My name is Erin Micklow, and I'm here with Dave Stukin of David Hi. and the Curse. How are you? I'm great. It's nice to see you again. We always see each other. We've been friends for so long. Yeah, you're one of my best friends, and now you're finally on my show. Finally, after many, many years. It's been a long... It's been too long, man. <laughs> I've conned you into doing some promo stuff for me here and there, but I haven't been on the show. Because well, you weren't playing shows, and so tonight we're here at the Three O'Clock. It's clubs. been a minute. It has definitely been a little bit of time since I've been playing. Yeah, but you're not new to the music scene. You have been in music for more than half your life. Can you talk about your musical background and how you got started as a musician? Uh, I think it all started just being um, alone a lot as a kid because I was a single child. And being a single child, I had a lot of free time on my hands because my parents were doing parent things and I was in my room and it's not a sob story. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to change anything because it, it, I started to fall in love with like the, the music that I would just hear around, like for instance, Phantom of the Opera, right? Like my mom was really into Andrew Lloyd Webber, Phantom of the Opera. So I started singing because I would listen to that tape in the car. And then, so you had that on my mom's side when driving with her, which was scary. And um, the Phantom of the Opera is here inside <laughs> your mind. That shit. And then on driving in my dad's car, it was always Jerry Lee Lewis on Great Balls of Fire. I remember he had Jerry Lee Lewis' greatest hits. I think he had, uh, I know he had ACDC Back in Black and um, Roy Orbison. <laughs> and so I just, but I was, I was in love with Jerry Lee Lewis. So I started seeing that was, that got rock and roll, you yeah. know? And um, this is when I'm uh, four years old. So flash forward, I was in Guitar Center when I was about 12. And playing guitar and singing, like, you know, how people do these days. But I was 12, so it was okay. I wasn't uh, 28 or, or 38 or yeah. 50. Yeah, it's cute when it's kids. Yeah, so I was doing that, like, putting on a concert for everybody. Yeah. And uh, this, like, crazy dude came up to me and my dad and was like, your son is amazing. He needs to be in my band. So I go and I, like, this guy built, like, this studio and he's got his kid. His kid was... Um, like a virtuoso drummer and yeah. his kid was about 11 or 12 so we had a kid rock band not kid rock not the yeah, guy like a, a child a child yeah but it wasn't really child's we we played originals i remember one call, a song i recall skateboarding is not a crime and i didn't even really want to write that song but he was like you need to write songs about people and places that you know and so like I was already writing songs because I started writing when I was like 10 or 11 around this time. So that's how I first started playing music professionally because he would book us gigs. So he played this gig at this place called The Crest. And we opened for an 80s metal band called The Bullet Boys. Was that the place that was on Hollywood Boulevard? This place was actually in Old Torrance in the okay. South Bay of LA where I'm from. And um, I played my first show. It was my 12th birthday. It was either my 11th or 12th, I can't remember, but I, it was, I remember we went to Knott's Berry Farm the day after. <laughs> but then high school, garage bands, blah, 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 it all turned into this band, The Breakdowns. And that's when we were like late teens and it was Chain Reaction and pay to play shows in Hollywood when the Key Club was there. Yeah. And then we, as I was getting older, this was getting the time when substance abuse started coming in and the, the shows got crazier and the lifestyle got crazier and the breakdowns we played till i was 22 and, went, and it, it just disbanded out of disarray yeah. because everybody was really really having some issues so they won't say anymore but what happened was when this is when i'm you come into play around 2008 yeah we've been friends 23 for that long. <laughs> yeah 
I started a band called The Strangers. Yeah. With Which, Rob Malucky. And they were amazing. And you, I remember seeing you when, on the tour you opened for Social D. Mm-hmm. Because what, Two Bags produced that Yes, album. yes. So this is when life got good for <laughs> some time. <laughs> So, with the strangers was a culmination of me, Rob Malucky from Dwayne Peters and the Huns and the Pushers. Mm-hmm. Okay, he now has the Volturas with yeah. Matt Freeman. Yeah. So it was me. It was Rob Malucky. I'm not dropping names. I want people to know who I'm talking about. And then Johnny Two Bags. We were the strangers in most. And there was Shane who played bass, and Julian was a drummer. Who's Julian's now playing guitar. But the basically strangers was like a holy trinity of me rob and johnny two bags yeah and he produced the record and it was an amazing album called the human condition johnny's an amazing producer my songwriting went up a whole notch then and that's when you met me and that's when i really came into my own yeah because you learn like there's the powers of working with a good producer is so important you know he he had all of his knowledge of years and years as a professional touring musician that he could kind of mentor you with 100 percent. and you know the, the what's so funny is i knew johnny since t- for about five years before that yeah i was like 17 16 when i met johnny yeah six seven years i, I met johnny when i was 16 as a little grom giving out cds <laughs> at shows i would lurk backstage i met johnny behind the palace which is now the avalon at the dropkick murphy's large frederickson show Okay. And Johnny was coming out. I'm like two bags, and I and I and and I had so ironic. I had a fucking prayer card of Dennis Dinell, rest in peace. It was from that Angel Sing benefit. It was in my wallet. I had nothing else for him to sign, and it must have been so weird for him to sign um, one of his friends who passed away, who he was the predecessor of. But maybe an honor at the same time. But I, Johnny actually knows knew some of my songs. He walks in the studio for the Strangers. He goes. Huh, Stukin? <laughs> and it just, it went from there. They t- Social Distortion took us under their wing, and we were able to do uh, all of Canada, all the U.S., and it was really cool. And- I still have that CD. So, I mean, obviously, one of my favorite songs, and I saw it on the comments on your post yesterday for this show, people were like, are you going to play St. Mary's? That's one of my favorite songs from The Strangers. <laughs> Yeah, actually we are. With uh, the David Stukin and the Curse, I'm like, I'm, I'm right now. I'm really trying to make it like a greatest hit set, yeah. or greatest misses. It's like a, <laughs> it's a set of the greatest misses. Yeah. But um, yeah, there we're playing s- some Stranger songs and some Dead Relatives songs, which is the band I did after Strangers, and well, so, then after Dead Relatives was David Stukin and the Curse. So how did it morph into that? Because you know, with the success that the Strangers had, and you know how that fell apart, what was the choice for you to not continue on with the Strangers and start new bands? I think, I think that I, I have too much integrity to just take a name because the name went out there. It wasn't the Strangers without Rob. Yeah. It wasn't the Strangers without Rob. It yeah. just wasn't. It, 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 without Rob and Shane, it wasn't the Strangers. And, you know, there were certain people who told me what you just said, to take the Strangers name and push forward and change it. And I've been told that up until a year ago by friends of mine. But without Rob and um, without Johnny also, because Johnny played third guitar on the album, like... When you listen to The Human Condition, it's on Bandcamp, by the way. That's the only way to find it for right now. I just still have the CD with the four songs on it. There's a whole record <laughs> that was out. But, like, you know, it's not The Strangers without Rob and without Johnny. So I was like, you know, 
I'll move forward and I'll just do another band. And the Dead Relatives, we actually did pretty well. That kind of just turned into David and the Curse and Julian, or David Stukin in the Curse and Julian um, went from the drums to the guitar. And yeah. now we're playing with Jared who recorded the uh, David and the Curse album or David Stukin the, the Epitaph for Love record. For sure. Jared recorded that and he plays with other, he plays with other bands um, and he, he's, My Chemical Romance is who he's currently playing with and Gerard Way. He's oh, cool. been playing with them for a long time. Talk about that album, An Epitaph for Love. That one, you released it officially last year on the streaming platforms Okay. Um, in 2022. Can you talk about the making of that album, who produced it, your process? Because that one was kind of a long time coming. Yeah. Yeah. It, it actually, An Epitaph for Love is... How many songs is it? 13 or 14? That's I, great. I mean, <laughs> since last night, realizing that you had dropped it on the streaming platforms, I've listened to it three times already. I love Thank it. Thank you. No, it's a, it's I a really, really appreciate that. No, it is a really, really great album. Well, I appreciate when anybody listens to my music. Yeah. Um, An Epitaph for Love came from like, there was like probably 46, 47 songs recorded. Yeah. And it was over a course of like six years. Yeah. Five or six years. I, I would know. say, and I kept telling you, just put it out. I know, just put it out because you like you wanted it to be. It so was my Chinese and... democracy, man. <laughs> you know, like it was my Axl Rose moment, I guess. But <laughs> I'm, I'll be honest with you, like of the two of all the records and recording time that I've done with various projects, I have to say that the two records I'm most proud of would be The Stranger's Human Condition, yeah. because, like you said. When Johnny came into the mix, bringing all of his experience, Johnny was so fundamental in bringing the best out of me yeah. and, and everybody else. Like I always say to Johnny, like there wouldn't have been a strangers if you weren't in the room. Like the band would have imploded before we hit the road. Johnny was like, or not only was he an amazing producer that recognized things sonically and said, okay, this year, this year. And, and it actually contributed to a lot of writing, you know? Yeah. Another thing that Johnny did was he was the referee between me and Robo, which is Rob. <laughs> so like, it, 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 however it worked, it worked for a while. And things are meant to be how they're meant to be. And like the song I have, nothing lasts forever, but it's good while it lasted. It was fun. Yeah, and I think that's just true of everything in life. Nothing lasts forever. That record and getting back to what you asked about the human condition, or this, the I'm confused by my own records. The Epitaph for Love record, the Epitaph for Love record, um, was just that was produced. That's I produced produced that, but with Paul Miner, yeah, Paul Miner and me and Jared too. It was basically produced by the guys playing on it. Yeah, you know, like I would come in with the tunes, I would come in with the structures, I would come in with guitar parts, but I would make a lot of parts in the studio. Paul Miner would play bass. Paul's a great engineer. A great dude, great friend, but he's a great engineer. He's got Buzz Bomb Studios. Mm -hmm. And I was able to go in and out of there for five years. And like Jared would meet me. And I met Jared at Hurley Studios. And um, I can't say enough. Uh, Epitaph for Love would not be as powerful it is, uh, as it is if it wasn't for Jared Alexander. Jared Alexander is, is the most talented drummer I've ever known. He's just amazing. And he brought those songs to life That's awesome. on Epitaph for Love. If it So I'm extremely excited because tonight's our first show with him. Yeah. Like it's like it's coming to fruition. Yeah. The, we're we're going to be able to play the songs on the record and have the band from the record for the most part, you know? Yeah. I mean, and that's that's a dream of mine to come true. Oh, 
musicians after the pandemic, you know, everything was kind of on hold where it was like they made the music. It was finally ready to come out. And then it was like, oh, no, we're in lockdown and shows aren't happening. And even when they started again, it was like a very slow ride into it. Um, yeah, I think that I think that it was it was inevitable for it to come back. I think there was some some uncertainty there for when it was going to happen. And a lot of people ha- went through hard times. They're still going through hard times. Yeah. Like in the pandemic, I mean, you and I, we spoke on the phone a lot because, you know, we were some of those people that were fucking scared. You know, I quarantined very strictly as did you because because of your parents and things like that. And it was like, it, you know, everybody, you had to respect everybody's choices about how they decided to live their life. But we were the ones that were like, fuck this shit, we're hiding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, I think a lot of people did that. I think a lot of people didn't. And I have no, I'm not going to take any stance on that right yeah. now. I just think we that. We all got through it the best I, we could. We all got through it the ways we, we wish to. And I'll tell you something. The isolation affected everybody, you know. Yeah. And um, I think what's so special about this show for me is this is actually the first rock and roll show I've played since, you know, the shit hit the fan with um, COVID. Yeah. But it's still hitting the fan. That's the thing. You know, it's still around. It's it's not it's near the severity, but our perception about it has changed very greatly. Yes, definitely. Our perce- because we've all ex- we've and I'm and and all I'm saying is we've all accepted a level of risk. Yeah. None of us. N- n- we all know we're not untouchable anymore. Yeah. Whereas there was this fear and this hope that we could get out without being phased by it. But everybody was affected by it in one way or another. Yeah. I know many people that lost their lives, three people who lost their lives. And, you know, people are still getting sick. But I think that with everybody, with all the first responders and with all the healthcare workers, like they're the heroes who got us through this. For you sure. know, it was everybody in the hospitals who was working around the clock. It was all of the firefighters, you know, working around the clock and all of the EMTs the 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 police officers even everybody who was really 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 couldn't take off and also you know i don't want to talk about covid anymore i'm glad it's fucking over for the most part So let's talk about um, some of your musical influences. You know, for in the entire time I've known you, you've just always been a huge music person. As you discussed at the beginning of this interview, you know, growing up, the musical influences from your parents. But let's talk about some. It of the wasn't really you... from my parents. I don't mean to cut you off, but like no. they didn't know shit really about no, but music. That was, they just had a couple of tapes you... they bought at Target. No, but when you Kmart. started to kind of formulate your own taste in music, my dad knew rock and roll. My dad got me into rock and roll. I will give him credit. God rest his soul. Um, my dad, George Stukin Sr. No, he was George Stukin Jr. My grandfather, who I never met, was George Stukin Sr. George Stukin, my father, got me into rock and roll. And the influences, how did, you know, what kind of music do I listen to? I would say that it hasn't changed that much. I don't listen to Phantom of the Opera anymore, I'll no. tell you that. But, <laughs> you know, no. as far as my influences, like, goes back to classic rock and really old classic rock and um, blues and just punk rock and roll and and you know basically I like to get to the fucking roots of everything and you'd be surprised like if you're driving around me you'll probably hear the Shirelles okay. more than you'll hear like you know Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers you'll hear you'll hear fucking Ronnie Spector or something you know like I like to listen to a lot of oldies when I'm driving and a lot of jazz um I find that a lot of times I have my own songs in my head that I'm writing. And so sometimes it's really hard to focus on listening to music, but I love Tom Petty. Obviously I love the Rolling Stones. I love John Lennon. Yeah. I love, um, I love all, all, every kind of music. I don't, I never, I never say any kind of music is bad music. Cause like, I think it was Chuck Berry who said, as long as it gets your feet tapping, it's good music, you know? Yeah, for sure. That's, 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 that's the ethos I kind of live by. 
Well, and I think for you, you know, it's very apparent if you listen to your music that you tell stories in your songs. It's not really so much about, I mean, I feel like every musician tells stories, but yours are very vivid stories. Can you... Very visceral, huh? Yeah. Can you talk more about that of your process when you sit down to write a song? I think it's hard for me to talk about myself with the, with, with writing because sometimes I don't know where it comes from. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like sometimes I... It just comes to me like I'll be driving some of my best songs I've written in the car. I'll be driving past something and I'll, I'll have to get off the freeway to sit on my notepad and I'll just sit in like, I don't know, uh, a Yoshinoya parking lot somewhere in Garden Grove. Yeah. And, no, but for real, I'm just saying anywhere. I'll sit in the 7-Eleven parking lot and just sit there and and write write a song it's trippy it, it trips me out sometimes and then sometimes i'll have a song like americana jukebox it takes time to write and i have to and just and a lot of songs on epitaph for love were sporadically written but then when i went into the studio that's when with my writing the lyrics usually come first mm -hmm. Because they just kind of pop into my head. They either come or they don't. Well, what is it for you that inspires you to write so many love songs? Like the majority of your songs, it's about love. It's about people. It's about the human struggle. Like, I, I don't the know. They're all themes. love songs. Um, the recurring themes, love songs. Well, then that's breakup life. Songs. But that's life because I, I I write about like I write about, I like to write what people can feel and identify. I've always said this. My if if people can relate to my songs and enjoy the music, but like when I was a kid, the music that I loved is this, are the bands that I could relate to. Yeah. You know, that it made me feel something inside. Like I remember one time I was sick and I got in the car and put on Green Day Dookie and I, my dad goes, what's up? Well, you're now you're better because I didn't want to eat. I was like sick and mad. And I put on this record in my disc man or cassette, uh, walk man. And um, I remember it was just like it made me feel better. And as far as the people and the, the themes, some of them are dark, some of them are love songs, some of them are love less songs. Yeah. I think that um, I like to just write, when I talk, when I, when I sing, you were saying about people. Yeah. When I, when I sing about people, it's usually people that I've met through my life that I bring back, even if it's like somebody who worked somewhere, you know, and I can like feel something from them you yeah. know, then I will, if I'm just, if I'm inspired to do it, it'll happen. Like I wrote this song, Can Can Room, that we're playing tonight, in high school. Yeah. And it's a true story. I was, I remember I went back to school on Monday from being in Vegas on the weekend and had that song and like, uh, we recorded it, I gave it to my teacher and he played it on Monday morning. He was like this cool dude from Minnesota who loved the replacements. And one of his things was he would play songs. So Amy was actually a dancer at Can Can Room. That was her real name. And I wrote that song. So like th that's that started, like I'm trying to say, I don't know where some of it comes from. That yeah. started when I was really young. I would it was say- the isolation of being alone made me- I was just gonna me, say that. It's like you're- Ima yeah, characters. I'm an only child as well, and I would make up stories with my Barbies. Yeah, it's <laughs> that's all my songs are stories with Barbie. <laughs> You know, you can just change Barbie's name and, you know, <laughs> you know, I like to write about my Corvette and um, cruising, cruising PCH in Malibu. Well, so let's talk about hanging out at Nobu with you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Let's talk about the current lineup of the band um, that is playing tonight. How did you guys come together? I kind of touched on that because Jared was on the record. Yeah. The Jared, the drummer, was on the record. And then we've got Kevin, who is a, a mutual friend of, of mine. Ke Kevin is friends with the view. He's friends. He's a photographer. He's a professional photographer. He's an amazing yeah. photographer. Yeah. Camera guy Kev or Kevin Focus. You'll yeah. have to add his, uh, his, his social media on this. 
Social media. You don't have to add it on this. I wouldn't even call Julian a friend. He's a brother. Julian's my brother, and he just went from playing drums to guitar. We've broken up a few times, but that's how brothers are. Yeah. We love each other, and uh, that's how the band came about, because I, I was with Julian every day, you know, because he's like my brother. We yeah. found Kevin, and then when Jared was available, he comes in and plays, and we're going to just move forward. We're going to take 2023 and do whatever we can with it. For sure. And just be positive and be happy and grateful and have gratitude that we can do this now. Yeah. Because for so long, like I said, I could talk about it, but who the fuck wants to talk about the time we couldn't do this? It's time to focus on what we can do now. No, and I am really excited because in a lot of our phone calls in the pandemic, you had talked about that, that you wanted to do shows again. And, you know, I've always been a fan of your music. You're thank a beautiful you so musician. Much. Oh, th that's like, that goes back to thank you for calling me beautiful. You know? <laughs> coming, coming, coming from a model, that's a, that's a high compliment. So thank you. Thank you very much. But, um, you know, I'm no, I'm no, what's that guy who's really famous right now from that zombie show? What's his name? Baby, what's that guy's name? The guy who's really beautiful right now. <laughs> what's his name? He's in the, the show, but the zombies. Yeah, Pascal, whatever his name is, he's really beautiful. So thank you for calling me beautiful. Well, I he's your, the I it, he's your, like the GQ I guy. I your songs, but oh, I, I, mean. I I really like Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy, hey, if you're watching this, dude, listen to my music because I'm a really big fan of yours. And if you ever want to do jujitsu, I would let you dislocate my arm. <laughs> But speaking of that, you are actually a boxer and you've been boxing for many, many years. Yeah, Tom Hardy, if you're out there, let's spar, but go real light. You know what I mean? How did you get into boxing? Because you, you could like knock somebody the fuck out. Uh, I, I would never do that. You wouldn't because it's ethical. But how did you get into boxing? I was I was 15 or 16 and I went to a house party and I got in a fight and I got my ass kicked because the dude was a wrestler. Yeah. So I started boxing. Yeah. <laughs> and then I just took it up as a sport. When I was really young, I did Taekwondo. It was, like my parents were kind enough to let me do Taekwondo. Yeah. And I was like this little kid. I was four or five because I remember it stopped when I broke my right arm on first grade and I fractured it and I couldn't, I couldn't spar anymore. But I was a little kid doing sparring. And I would go to competitions and fight bigger kids because no little kids my size sparred. I yeah. couldn't even fit in the helmet and stuff, but I, I didn't even do any form. I just went ah, and just went at people. So then I, you know, I don't know. I started, I guess that started me in like combat sports. But, you know, the thing about all that is it's not a tough guy thing. It's just a sport. And if, if you have to defend yourself or defend somebody you love, you can. But I would never, ever, ever instigate yep. any kind of fight because I don't glorify violence in any way. But I think it teaches you discipline, which helps you as a musician. Maybe the other way around. Because you need a lot of discipline as, uh, as a musician. You need a lot of discipline to box. You need a lot of discipline to do anything in life that's yeah. difficult. Yeah. You That's know, true. if you want to sit around and play video games and eat, you know, hot Cheetos all day long, then you don't need any discipline. If you want to do something that you're that, that requires, you know, some kind of upward trajectory, you have to have discipline. So, I guess that's where. And you know, the thing about me, boxing. I'll put this is the last thing I'll say about because you asked me is, it's a solo sport. Yeah. They call it the loneliest sport in the world. Yeah. And for me, that worked really well. Yeah. I do want to close out with what is coming up for you personally what's coming up for you and the band i'm in love you are in love like james brown <laughs> you are in love she's very beautiful oh. <laughs> you're a lucky man i am <laughs> I, I am for, for once in my life i have a very good woman Yay. 
Yay. That's the first time. I'm thir- I know. I'm 37 years old. It took me that long. I know. Oh, it's crazy. It takes huh? a while sometimes, yeah. right, babe? <laughs> I can't necessarily say, like, I would. I want to take on whatever comes, you know, our way. I want to be playing as much as possible. We're going back in the studio. There's like, I told you that there's 47 songs from the Epitaph for Love session. Well, maybe we'll use some of those. Definitely going to re-release The Stranger's Human Condition. Definitely probably going to re-release some of the old Dead Relatives records, the Breakdowns records. Go back, release some of my old catalog. But then, as far as releases, we're going in the studio for sure. We're going to do a follow-up to Epitaph for Love, another full length. I don't really like EPs. If I'm going to go in the studio, I'm going to make a record. (laughs) And um, we're going to play wherever we can. Right now, we just want to, you know, play really well. Yeah. Which you always, that's from the entirety of knowing you, you know, you and I have shared that sentiment where you'd rather not do it than do it and it sucks. There's so many blokes out there doing this that if you don't like, if you don't stand out and do it right, what the fuck's the point of even doing it? Yeah. I mean, like, I don't want to do anything and not not do the best I can do. For sure. And if like, there's so many bands that if you're not going to, if you're not going to own up to like your ethos of like, for me, it's like what Tom Petty said. He's like, you can't call us blues rock. You can't call us punk rock. You can't call us classic rock. That's, that that would just be bullshit. We're a rock and roll band. Yeah. And that's, that's my ethos. We're a rock and roll band. I'm a rock and roll singer. Even the Americana stuff, like Americana jukebox, it's 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 all rock and roll. I know it's only rock and roll, but I like it. That's what it is. All right. Thank you, everybody. Give me a hug. Hi, this is David Stukin from David Stukin in the Curse, and you're watching Last Rockers TV.